Welcome back to Expanding the Zone. I'm Shane Combs of my brother Matt, as always, is right here with me. And uh, we're into episode six now. A time continues to fly, a, a, a real successful first month. We can't thank you enough for watching here on YouTube or listening to us out there on that. Uh, however, you get your podcast, be it Spotify, Apple. Again, we're on all of those. So, uh, again, welcome. However, you're watching or listening, uh, we, again, love the support. Uh, really appreciate it. The feedback's been really fun. And, you know, Matt, on this number six uh, title, uh, I'm taking a look at America's pastime needs a push to the present. And, and I wanted to explain before I throw it your way why this title, why now in terms of this show? You know, each each show along the way has, has come from what's going on in the real world of sports, you know, be it the Astros cheating, the last dance, all these different things we've talked about for five shows now. I won't repeat them all. Here's how I kind of arrived at this one. As you and I have been talking, you know, as we always do in between shows, uh, in terms of what's going on in the sports world, how does that relate to high school sports? And and, and I've kind of started to look at some of these things uh, in terms of the high school sports uh, season, obviously the spring was canceled. Um, some of the MAC uh, conference and, and some of the smaller schools college-wise around Ohio here and really throughout the Midwest starting to make decisions at Little League, uh, having some tough decisions to make. It looks like some decent news is coming down, which we'll talk about throughout the show. Um, and and I, think, I think what's going to happen is two things. One – I know you and I have been wanting to put together a mini series. And when I say series, I don't even, I don't necessarily mean consecutive shows. I just mean throughout the first year of our show here, we've been wanting to do kind of a state of the game uh, and taking different high school sports and, and looking at, I know a lot of people are really excited for our basketball show, uh, which is going to be coming here uh, down the road somewhere. Uh, I also think we've been looking at a little league show. We'll kind of touch on that a little bit. I know we've been talking about power of media. We've been talking education versus entertainment. And I think all of these things kind of combine now, but I just think at this time where the spring sports have just been, um, you know, canceled off for, for the spring here in terms of uh, high school sports, and then with everything going on the college level, it just seemed like now is a, a real, real positive time. My question for you, and you can comment about baseball in particular if you want, but what is it about the, the, the series that you and I have talked about in terms of the state of the game? Why do you think state of the game – for, for different sports is something that one's fun to talk about, fun to listen to, but maybe something, a um, um, type of message that people out there in terms of coaching and fans and leadership and administration and all that need to hear. Well, one of the things you and I talked about when we got started on all this was um, wanting, wanting to be a part of a solution, you know, not just one more voice in the crowd that complains or whatever. So I think the state of the game for, for me means – you know, as we talk about these different sports throughout the next, you know, couple months, um, off and on, like you said, I want it to be, I want us to, to yeah, A, identify, identify some, some good and some bad, obviously, but then hopefully, hopefully offer solutions or offer ways that maybe we can improve it. Um, you know, tonight we're going to focus on spring sports, like you said, baseball, probably more specifically than the others, but I'm, I'm sure we'll talk a little bit about spring sports in general at the high school level. And, 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 and where are those sports at right now? You're getting ready to talk about, I know some challenges that spring sports face, right? Let me ask you this, I guess, with the situation right now, before we even get started, Shane, with, with, with the, with the spring sports having been just canceled uh, here in Ohio. And I think most everywhere, what, what effect is do you see that having, if any, on spring sports in the future? I mean, is it one of those things where it reignites the fire in some people, maybe? Like, man, I really missed that. I, I didn't realize, you know, you don't know what you got until it's gone type of thing. Or, or do you think it just further hurts a season in which we already see some – participation number issues and things like that. So what, what, I mean, what are you, I guess, what's your take on that before we get started here? I, I, I would say you'll get a little bit of a mixed bag. Uh, certainly there's, there's your guys and, and your gals that, uh, you know, spring sports might be their favorite sport. It might be their best sport. It might be look at something, you know, they're, they're looking to do at the next level. I'm um, sure there's a great passion there, particularly the underclassmen, uh, they lose one of those four opportunities to do it. Um, as far as a program, it's very, very concerning. As you heard me say in the opening, 
I, I, I've been, a, first of all, I've been a spring coach for 25 straight springs. And, and I understand that not just the high school level at the collegiate level and so forth, that if financial hits come and things have to be cut, let's, let's just call it what it is. It's going to be some of the first to go. So I, I think that yes, on in the passion in terms of your coaches and your players, your athletes, yes, they're, they're going to be very passionate to get back at it and so forth. Some of those kids that are, are fringe, eh, I, I don't know. I'll tell you who I really worry about is your incoming freshman class because as you're going to hear me talk about throughout the show, one of the big problems in high school baseball, and I think softball runs into it, not so much in track, is is your disconnect with your junior high age group. Uh, it, you know, throughout the little league, it goes pretty well and so forth. You get into junior high, that's, that's a time, that's, a, that's an age group that's very difficult to keep in, interested in terms of your school program. So, those are the things that, that I worry about. When I see e as high as the collegiate level, a conference like the MAC already taking away things in 2021, I see a, I see a, a university the size of Akron trying to hold on to their 19 sports to stay Division One, and and I'm reading today that baseball is is funded completely by donation anyway. I mean that's that's you know that's something that that's that's very very telling, when you think of the financial difficulties even at that level you start to understand, you know, why it is so difficult at the high school level. So there, there's financial things I, I get concerned about. And uh, I realize, you know, year to year, you fight for some of those things. And sometimes when you lose a year and maybe even have a next year look, you know, kind of different, it, it, it is, it's a little bit worrisome to, 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 to kind of think about, you know, some of the challenges ahead. Yeah, and I mean, like you mentioned, if, if, if when it starts to affect the college level, uh, and especially the small college level where, where, let's face it, a lot of athletes that we see when they go to college, it's the small college level, you know, and you start to see some of the small college level take this hit due to this whole thing. Man, can we even keep the sport right now? And, you know, you see, and I, I don't want to get too far ahead of ourselves, but you see the Legion. Uh, some Legion already canceled, Legion baseball and things like that, you wonder, okay, gosh, you know, everything sort of trickles down here and what kind of effect does it have? Because wouldn't you agree, like with spring sports in general, baseball, um, softball, I think to an extent, and and uh, even, you know, track and field even a little bit, don't you think spring sports, it's kind of, and maybe I'm wrong here. I mean, tell me if I am, You like you said, you've, you've had way more experience at the spring than I have, but it seems like, the athletes that participate in these sports, they sort of love them. You know, they grow up around them. I mean, I, I don't see a lot of kids, I guess, say things like, hey, I'm going to give baseball a try this year. It's either you play it or you don't. And you, So well, I guess what I'm saying with that is there's already this limited group that does it. And if, if, if due to this stuff that's going on right now and some of the things you're getting ready to talk about, if, if, that, if that interest – continues to, to decline or wane, you have to worry a little bit about them going forward, don't you? Well, you do. And it, it, there's a lot of obstacles there. And as I was saying there, there's a different group of kids. And and, and as your numbers, you, you try to maintain those throughout and you, and you have some challenges. And I guess that's where I guess that's where I would start here on the show agenda. I would start to take a closer look at just the high school game and so many of the things that work against the game. Now, keep in mind, as we said, we don't want to be someone's just stating problems. We want to come up with solutions to these. But, but to, to get that conversation, get that ball rolling, we we want to take a look at what I I see as some of the the issues going on. First and foremost, has to be a financial situation. You know, we we are looking at spring sports as a serious cost and, and, and a thing that makes no money in return. My problem with that attitude as someone who's coached for 25 years is what I would say to the administration in return, we don't try to make money off of them. I, I, I don't know that I totally buy into the fact that we can't. Okay. I, 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 I simply look at it as, you know, we do. So let's just start with admission. We start with admission in, fall sports, winter sports. We charge people to watch junior high games. We, we, we charge to watch freshman games, JV games, obviously varsity games. I guess I would ask you as, a, as an athletic director, what would be one of the common responses I'm going to get across the, you know, a lot of high school administration when I ask, why aren't we 
figuring out a way to charge admission and trying to make some money off of these particular games because people people don't think twice about they know if they're going to go to a volleyball game if they go to a basketball game if they go to a football game any level that they're going to have to pay to, to to get in yet when we come to the spring it's almost like we we don't do it and then we we say well we're just losing money on these things i can't disagree with that i can tell you this i think schools basically do things um, or don't, they don't want to do things that cause criticism and to cause people to complain. Let's face it, like you said, it, it's kind of what you get used to, isn't it? You go to a football game, nobody walks up to the gate and says, I can't believe I have to pay five bucks to come to this game. All right? They're just used to doing it. Right. Um, but, you know, baseball, I know a couple schools that charge, and they've told me. People will come up to the gate and just lose their mind, throw a fit that they got to pay to get into a baseball game. Why? I don't know. I don't know the answer to that. I mean, I know the answer to that. The answer to that is they're not expecting to because they don't, they don't have to do it very many places. But to answer your question, I don't know why. Um, I don't know why that we treat baseball, softball any differently. Now, I will say this. When you charge admission for those sports, maybe should it be a little bit less than your normal dollar amount. You can make the argument you're not getting a JV game. Um, you've got uncertainty with spring sports, with weather and things like that. Now, we, now keep this in mind. Almost everybody charges for track, correct? Mm -hmm. See, and I think this is going to come to a point you're getting ready to talk about in a minute. What about facilities? Track lends itself to you being able to charge because it's at the football stadium, right? Everything's fenced in. You've got a ticket gate right there. I know – a lot of baseball fields, including the school I happen to be at, there's about six different ways to get into it, and and it, and it creates some issues of trying to charge when there's not one common entrance for everybody. So I think facilities is one thing, um, but I tell you, Shane, I, I really think it comes down to again what people are used to. I know a school that charges for parking. They charge for parking for football. They charge parking for basketball i believe they charge it for volleyball and they and i and, and i knew their ad i know uh, the, the guy that used to be their ad i got a ton of respect for him he's one of the best in the business and i asked him i said you know what what happened when you first started charging he said people lost their mind people everybody that came through there complained and he goes you know what we did we put fifteen thousand dollars in our pocket every year and just said you know sorry <laughs> <laughs> and but you know but here's the thing you know how many people complain now nobody because everybody knows when you go to this particular school, you're going to pay to park. So I guess what I'm saying is it's like anything else you do. If you set the tone, I guess, and you say this is what we're going to do, you got to put up with a little bit of frustration maybe early on. But then people get used to it and, and you move forward. But I agree. I mean, why, why should baseball, softball at the high school level be absolute zero revenue sports when it's not really necessary? Um, I, I think we should definitely look at charging for those. Well, as we continue to go down through some things here in my notes, um, you know, obviously the five o'clock start with daylight, that, that's, that's a problem. Um, you know, we, we mentioned facilities, you mentioned charging. Uh, fields and equipment, the, the, the amount of money that goes into those, uh, the game balls that, that, that go, the amount of game balls throughout a year compared to some of the other sports, I'm sure much, much higher. Um, I, I think the school calendar is a problem. Uh, I, think, I think that works against most, especially cold weather states here in Ohio, or if you're anywhere in the Midwest listening to us. I know we have some, some listeners down south. Again, appreciate your feedback. That was awesome to get. Um, I, I would say you're looking at this completely different because a lot of your warm weather states get a chance to do some creative things in your scheduling. So I guess those are the issues that, that come about. As we said, Matt, we want to get into some solutions a little bit. So here's some of the things, I guess, that I would start to at least try to compromise with. We're in a time where more and more people are putting uh, money into their athletic facilities. And what I would encourage schools to take a look at is when you are – building these new facilities, build them with the, the mindset of, you know, fans. You know, how, how do fans enter? Is it something that you'd be able to go? Because I, I look at it like this. I, I'm, not, I'm not silly here, okay? I understand that a basketball gate at, you know, even your most average schools gets you 1,000, 1,500, 2,000 people through the door. So, you know, you start doing the math there. You know, you're, you're getting up. You know, I know – 
I know what 1500 uh, people at five bucks give you what $7,500. I mean, it, you know, you're getting up into, I'm sure you're 12,000, 15,000, some of the bigger schools, bigger crowds, you get 3000 people, maybe to a big time football game. Yeah, I don't know. At a, but at a baseball game, I know that in the conference I've coached in now for two decades, I know that we're, we're consistently at varsity baseball games getting 40, 50, 60 people. And I guess my argument would be is that would take care of a little bit of your field maintenance. It would take care of a little bit of your game balls, your umpires, to the point where you wouldn't be viewed as a negative. Because I'm going to be honest, sometimes it, it, you're, you're almost viewed as if you're in the way or as if you are, are promoting something that's hurting your school from an athletic standpoint, which I, again, I think is really unfair to the amount of student athletes, especially in small school programs that might have 25, 30 kids involved in the program. You know I mean? How many times, how many times will a boys basketball program have that? How many times some football programs may be lucky to get 35, 40 on, on a, on a Friday night, right? Uh, now I know on the Friday night football, you get into your band members, you get into your cheerleaders, you get into a lot of different community dynamics. I get that. So I understand the financial situations are completely different. I guess I'm just looking at it from a standpoint of, can we have that opportunity to do it? And I don't want to throw this all on the schools because I think it's at the state level too. I know back in 14, 15, I had, I had some real nice players come through my program. We were very fortunate to win back-to-back -back district titles. Well, and, and I'll be honest, I didn't even know this at the time. And we got onto the district level and we were going to do some different things and the fan uh, the following was phenomenal, playing at the beautiful VA Memorial Stadium, got to go up to Beaversfield in Lancaster, Ohio. Incredible, hundreds and hundreds of fans from our small community filing in. And I had, I had through my basketball background and through the football playoff background, thought, well, this might be an opportunity to, to make a little financial, you know, um, you know, benefit for the athletic program, come to find out in the spring, they didn't even do that. So even at the OHSA level, correct, they don't even give you the opportunity to pre-sell those tickets. And I know you as an AD can maybe tell me better. I've heard you say throughout your success in your basketball program or the football programs that have had playoff success, I know that that's quite a bit of kickback. But don't you think that's even another example in the spring that we're not offering these schools a chance to, to kind of support their athletic program in, in a tournament situation? I think you have to start at the top. Most people's top is your state association. Um, what could they do a little differently? I, I think, you know, obviously that's one of them. Um, I think that, you know, baseball, softball, for instance, are all are such expensive sports when it comes to equipment. You mentioned this. And I guess I would ask, why Why do we constantly, every time we turn around, have to buy new equipment to meet rules and meet standards, too? Because it's like uh, all of a sudden you've got two dozen game balls left over from last year and you can't use them because there's supposed to be a new stamp on them this year, you know, and little things like that. So I think there are things at the top they can do to help. Um, but then I think it, it comes down to the responsibility of the schools, too. Uh, just, just going off a few of the things you just said right there, I mean, going back to admissions, uh, my solution, offering a solution that I think, again, you, you, hit, you, you hit the nail on the head. Try to have a facility where you can charge. I think charge a smaller amount. And I, and I know every school is differently on how they feel about that. I think there are some schools that think you, you should charge the same for every sport or whatever. I think a, a little bit of a lesser amount. You said 40, 50 people. I think you're probably undershooting that. A lot of the good baseball games I go to, I think there's 60, 80, 80 people there, you know. And I think if you charge three, $3 a head, you make enough, if nothing else, to cover your umpires for the evening and, and start to give yourself a chance to, to break even – on on the evening, at least with maybe the umpires, like I said, maybe whatever work you have to do on the field or field material for that night. Um, it's probably going to be hard at the high school level to actually profit in baseball or softball when you figure in busing and the whole the whole gamut of cost. But you can definitely dent that by by at least charging some admission. And, and I, I would say this. You mentioned Akron baseball and that's interesting it's funded you said it on donation correct what at, I read the, today, at, the yeah. at the college level so my, my thing is this when you're charging three dollar mission let's say to a baseball game um 
in essence, that's what you're asking for. You're asking the parents and the people that come to watch to support that program financially through a donation. I mean, really, that's what it is. You're donating three dollars to come in there and watch a baseball game. Probably got 13 home games a year, whatever. Um, maybe have a night or two where it's free. You're just just a fan appreciation night or whatnot. But but uh, but. But again, there's no reason not to try to offset the financial part of that a little bit. Now, you mentioned start times and things like that. Uh, not a whole lot you can do about the time of day you start, right? But but what about, and I think you were going to touch on, what about like when the season starts and ends? I think that could probably be adjusted a little bit. Well, from a when um, standpoint, I guess I would look at it in two sides. Let, let's first talk about that time. You know, the 5 o'clock start time, obviously you're playing almost every night, school nights, different things, and travel. I, I get it. Uh, I think if you have the opportunities throughout your area, if it means involving your media and so forth, like a, a lot of times I know radio is just not going to be interested in the 5 o'clock time slot. You know what I mean? Compared to a football game at 7.30 or a basketball game at 7.30, um, if you have facilities in your area – where lights can be used or different dynamics can be used there. I know you can't play there every night, but I know here in the Chillicothe area, like the VA Memorial Stadium is incredible. They, they host things uh, pretty much, you know, every, every single day, all day. Um, and it's been incredible to our baseball and softball uh, local growth in terms of our high school programs. So that's an idea because what it does is it becomes more fan friendly. It becomes more media friendly and, and able to kind of spread a little bit of promotion of your sport. Now, in terms of the calendar, our hands are tied for about three different reasons. And, and this is fascinating for me to throw back to you once I set it up because you're going to wear the hat of the AD. You're going to wear the hat of a basketball coach as a baseball fan, as someone who's coached baseball. What hurts us is this. Number one's weather. Okay, so we, we get started late March, and we're going to play basically April and May, and then tournaments start there in May, and really the state tournament usually falls really early June. And throughout that entire time period, we're running into prom, we're running into graduations, we're running into, you know, your booster clubs, your drama clubs usually put on your spring production. Why is drama club in the spring? Well, because, again, they're not going to touch Friday nights in the fall. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Right. It's one of those things. that it's They're in the spring. so And that's fine. I'm an English teacher. I, I, I support the drama club every year. I look forward to dinner and, 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 and uh, seeing the play and the, and the kids perform. That's awesome. But, but my point is this. We're, we're fighting all of these different things, and a lot of it comes back to our state testing. I know like here in Ohio, for example, I know when we test – I know that the ODE and, and some of these different schools would love to somehow change your summer vacation from June, July, August and get it more into a May, June, July. Well, I would almost push the other way for spring sports. If I had my perfect world, I would almost push it back the other side and allow us a little bit more of the nice weather in May to play a little bit more, start a little deeper into June. You know, what better thing than baseball on July 4th being the capper of your state tournament or whatever. Now, why is that never going to fly in today's modern game? Well, now because of the way things have changed in the last 20 years in June. Could you imagine as a basketball coach, your basketball and your football coaches, if, if spring sports were to end up going all the way through June, how people would start to relate to that? That, that wouldn't fly. So what I'm saying is if we don't have some sort of calendar change, it seems like spring is getting uh, kind of handcuffed a little bit in terms of they're saying, hey, here, here's April. We'll give you a little bit of May, and then you figure out how to play 27 games, and then we're going to start a tournament, and, and we're going to rattle those off there and, and get everything done by early June. It just seems to me that the calendar doesn't match what fall sports get, what spring sports uh, and winter sports get, and then what spring sports get. And again, I understand there's weather. I understand there's school schedule. I understand there's a lot of things out there. But but you see how just giving spring, gosh, two more weeks, two more weeks would be a big time benefit in terms of maybe just growing a little bit of the game and getting full seasons in. It seems like, again, it goes back to we started with our state association. What can they do? Because obviously there's some things we need to do within our own schools, right? There's some things that we can control within our own schools uh, that we have no excuse but to look ourselves in the mirror. But uh, things like, like you said, you know, 
we see it seems like we just use the spring to just throw whatever activity in uh, because again we're not going to take away from football we're not going to take away from basketball so we just sort of I think most spring sports coaches that I talk to their number one complaint is man I got to deal with everything I got to deal with the Kings Island trip I've got to deal with you know uh obviously things like prom and school plays like what you said are important i'm not taking away from those things but we've we've let them grow so out of control i'll use prom as an example we had a team last year in our league not play us on a friday in a makeup game even though it's a league rule that we're supposed to use the next available day to for a makeup game did not play us on a friday because they had prom on saturday so it's like okay i understand we can't play on saturday because prom even though, you know, we, we got to have a nice prom play. dinner. I mean, at 10 o'clock in the morning, you, gotta, you know, <laughs> girls have to get their hair done. Guys want to go out to eat, whatever. So we can't play on Saturday, but now we can't play on Friday. It's almost like my, my eight year old, when it's his birthday, it's his birth week, you know, like, like we've got to keep the whole week open. It's not just a day <laughs> now, you know? So, so I think, again, I think it's just so easy to, to say, ah, oh, well, it's just spring sports. We can we can adjust. We can reschedule. I can remember back in the day, just going to people going to every extreme measure to get a field ready to play. And, and unfortunately, it seems like now in some places it's just easier to cancel. You know, again, we wouldn't. The last thing in the world we'd want to do is, if we could avoid it, was to cancel basketball games, football games, whatever, but baseball, I will just cancel and reschedule, which causes you to lose non-league games, which causes you to play less games, right? And hurt your athletes instead of getting 27 games and all of a sudden you're playing 18 games. So there's a lot of things we can do within our school. The thing that interests me though is that start end date you brought up, which would have to be obviously a state association thing. You know, I heard you say what better way uh, to, to end your season than like an early July state tournament or whatever, right? Like a celebration of the game. Well, you said that will never fly, but, but here's the deal. It, it would fly if the state association said this is the way we're going to do it because then basketball and football coaches would just have to deal with it, right? Um, so that really would have to come from the leadership above to make that call. Let me ask you this, just, just throwing this out. I mean, I'm not trying to go in a different direction here, but you got me thinking. They just made an announcement today in Ohio that on May 26th, we're going to be allowed with some restrictions, which I haven't read yet because I think they were supposed to post them tonight on the, on the state website. But like basically baseball, softball, limited non-contact sports is what they're calling them, can start up. So your little leagues and things like that. Could high school, just looking back, and I'm, look, hindsight's twenty twenty, right? I mean, the, our state association had some very difficult decisions they had to make throughout this thing. But could they have played high school baseball then, theoretically? I mean, if I said to you, hey, on May 26th, you practice for seven days, six days, seven days, and then we're going to play a tournament. That's it. We're not playing a regular season schedule. We're going to have a state tournament. We're going to start the state tournament early June. It'll be over, like you said in your example a minute ago, by early July. Could we have had high school baseball, softball, or high school baseball and softball tournament, a track tournament? Could we have done that? Just, I mean, we're talking about a once, hopefully, hopefully, a once in a lifetime deal here with what we're going through right now, right? And couldn't we have made that exception and 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 played that, or are there just are there too many moving parts to that? I think you could have played a version of them. I, I will say that that late, it was going to be a very difficult task. Uh, at that point, you have several graduations going on. Um, how are seniors going to start to handle that? Um, how are, how's every individual school? You see this right now with professional ranks, with college ranks, talking about certain colleges, opening up certain things, certain even professional teams. Yes, we're going to work out. No, we're not. Um, I think there would have been some dynamics there. There'd have been a lot of individual school decisions to make. Um, you know, the comfort level of, you know, when we're dealing with high school kids, I think parents deserve uh, a major voice. Um, so there, there would have been a lot of things to get in the road. Now, could they play a version of those tournaments? Yeah, probably. Um, do, do I think it would have been very difficult to pull off? Yeah, I do. I, I think there'd have been a lot of roadblocks this late in the process. So even, even as a coach, as much as I would have loved to have seen a baseball team of mine with eight seniors to get some sort of opportunity for closure, I think that would have been very, very, very difficult. Now, what I what I will say is 
those are the types of things that I think we need to, to, to look at in terms of how creative can we get moving forward? Because again, you know, what's this upcoming year going to look like? We don't know. But again, let's start with your little league discussion, them getting an opportunity to, to do those, those things. You know, somewhere down the line, I'm sure we're going to have a show just on Little League and we're going to do things, so I won't get too far off to the topic here. But I will say this, Matt, baseball at the Little League level probably does it better than than most. Um, you know, in terms of we don't ask uh, an, an eight-year-old to play on the same size field as Mike Trout. Okay, we, right, we, right. We, we, have, we have different dimensions and we have different things, you know, where, where we'll, we'll ask a seven-year-old to, to, to play oftentimes on, on some dimensions, you know, be it the size of the rim or so forth, the same as an NBA player would, um, you know, and, and, and those other sports. So baseball, I think, has some sense in terms of how they stair-step it from who's pitching, uh, where they're playing, some different things. And as we get into a little league, I'll talk more. But don't you think that is a giant step? When we talk player development, don't you think the the, the ability to still have a little bit of a little league, a, a little bit of summer opportunity for kids at at, uh, at least certain age groups to play is a, is a step in – a huge step in a positive direction for the sport of baseball and and really be it softball or anything track wise that they can start to do individually uh, is really, really important for spring sports. I think so. And I I was going to ask you, I mean, is is it as critical as ever right now that we get some summer baseball? And I guess, I guess I'm asking you that just from a standpoint, again, of that interest, right. Of, of Mm -hmm. do, can, can we afford to lose, kids at that age uh can we afford to lose numbers due to the interest sort of going away if if, if we go a whole year and don't play Does well i think sense? i think what well, makes total sense because i think you said it on on at least two previous shows you talked about choices right you talked about kids have opportunities to do a lot of different things and let's face it if if something isn't available, they're probably going to choose something else. You know, as more and more things become available back into somewhat of a, of a normal seat come fall, come winter, whatever. So to, to lose an entire year of, of a particular thing, I think would, would, would really, really hurt um, in terms of those things. The other thing I wanted to take a look at was the power of media. And I'm a firm believer that the two sports I love the most – baseball, basketball, but again, I love them all. I, you know, you and I enjoy playing golf. We love football. Um, We love watching football. Now my, you know, my, my football career in terms of playing quarterback went about four downs and I basically took about four snaps and knew one play, you know, you know, snap it and throw it as far as I I could. I was more of the defensive back there, but it, the, the, the point I'm making is as these other sports grow, the thing that worries me the most about baseball, basketball, for that matter, and kind of kind of tease another state of the game show, is our inability to be willing to change and accept it. See if you follow this analogy with me, Matt. It's kind of baseball, let's face it, in terms of historical value, and I want to tie this into the media here in just a second, but let me kind of go this route first. It's kind of like a game of chicken. And when two sides start going as fast as they can at one another, and if one side's not willing to give, the idea of chicken, right, is, you know, someone's going to pull away or, or you're going to end up in, in a head-on collision, right? And obviously, a head-on collision ends terribly for everybody involved. My point is this. If, if at some point we do not take the old style, appreciate the tradition, appreciate some of the old school values, and marry them with the new school, I think we're going to have a hard time relating to the modern day athlete and keeping some of the best athletes interested in playing baseball. So I'm going to go to about three levels here, but let me go media first with you. I wanted you to kind of understand my analogy first. Don't you think we have to figure out a way when I think back through the history of Tony Gwynn being, you know, uh, a big time basketball player in college and then finally going baseball, Kenny Lofton played there for Arizona, you know, and I think of all these guys that, um, you know, John Elway was drafted to play baseball. Tom Brady was drafted to play baseball. You know, I'm probably missing some other ones just off the top of my head. But my point is, 
they, they choose, just like the, the more modern day example for, for maybe some of our younger lists is Kyler Murray. You know, if, if he's a guy that is going to um, make the decision coming out of college, am I going to go play quarterback? Am I going to go play baseball? Well, think about what he's looking at in terms of he's – he, he can go play quarterback for the Arizona Cardinals or he can go play for like the Midland, you know, rock hands or whatever the, the, the double A team is there for, for the A's. You see what I'm saying? Like right. it's one of those, it's one of those things that the media doesn't do baseball a lot of favors in terms of college athletes. Uh, we don't, we don't really follow college baseball. You know, we don't really know minor league baseball. We don't know these different things. So what happens is, at the higher levels, I just don't feel like media is selling the game. I think we're a little bit at fault at that. But don't you think that baseball at the highest levels are kind of getting, you know, I don't know, for lack of a better term, just kind of whooped by these other sports in terms of the way they sell their athletes and sell these, these things to the high school athlete in terms of a baseball is a cool option. Well, it's it, it's so old school and traditional to the point of, and I'm all for tradition and in, in sports. You know, we had, just had a show a couple of weeks ago. Where we made fun of some of that, right? Like the baseball coaches having to wear the uniform and all that. <laughs> but like, but but in all honesty, there's a place for some of that, but but for some tradition. But like, it always amazes me with baseball how you know if a kid, if a really talented kid is is. 20 years old he's he's just not seasoned enough to play to play major league baseball but a 20 year old can go straight into the nba and start you know that you don't see guys get drafted and 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 again why do people watch the football draft and they watch the basketball draft and they make a night of it and it's awesome is because they're going to see these people playing like next year Right. Why, why do you care about the baseball draft so that you can see some oh my team drafted a guy maybe six years from now I'll see him make his major league debut, right? I mean, right. very seldom do we do we do they move these guys along. So what happens is it filters down to where there's way too many minor leagues and rookie leagues and all that. You know, I've talked about this before, Shane. It's like so the college baseball game gets hurt. So now kids in high school, they don't get to see Bryce Harper playing for LSU or Mike Trout playing for USC. I mean, the, the, the college world series is still a pretty highly watched thing when it when it's on. Uh, you know, at that time of year, how cool would it be to see some of the best players to play the game playing for those colleges in that situation? But they're not because they've already taken the money and went to one of the minor league teams and started working the way up through an organization. So, so college baseball sort of watered down, and 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 um, and I just think it filters down. So high, there's no, but there's these kids. They don't have like you mentioned, Mike Trout. You just used him off an example a few minutes ago. The first time anybody knew about Mike Trout was when he was in Major League Baseball. That's when kids looked at Mike Trout. You know, people were looking at LeBron James when he was in high school. They were seeing him play high, basketball on TV in high school. Um, he mm -hmm. didn't go to college, but like take some of these other guys who are one and done, like Zion Williamson. He was all over YouTube, right? He was his high school games were on. All of a sudden, he goes to Duke. You get to watch him play for a year. By the time he gets to the NBA, you've already watched him develop and grow. You don't get that with baseball. So I think that I think that what you're saying is true. I don't know if I blame the media as much as they're covering what they're going to cover and what pays the bills. I I guess baseball needs to do a better job of of uh, making the lower levels more attractive. I guess. Well, no, that, that and that was the point for the solution I, I was going to go is I think you have to figure out a way to make it more enticing uh, to the media and, and go because I think what happens is exactly what you said. I mean, in the college game, if we start talking about Cassius Winston of Michigan State or Obi Toppin there at Dayton or whatever, most of your high school kids, most of your most of your adult fans at least know who you're talking about. Like you said, obviously Zion Williamson at Duke when he was there. But if I start throwing out names like, you know, Emerson Hancock and things like that, right-hand pitcher there for, for Georgia, or if I talk about the, that Martin kid, um, oh, um, Austin Martin, shortstop there at Vandy, you know, those, those, are names, those are names that most sports fans don't even know. You see what I'm saying? Those are some of your top college players. And, again, it comes back to a situation of I think you, – you mentioned I think we have way too many minor league systems. I would love to see some of the minor leagues go – 
get it more to a double triple A type thing, get more college involved the way we could see these kids play a little bit more. Now, I wanted to throw another thing out in terms of style. I think, I think this is a little bit where coaches are to blame because I think coaches, we can't always get on the same page. Sometimes it comes from decisions of moving games to ballparks that have lights and playing at different times. Certain people don't want to give up their home games or, or a lot of it comes down to the style. You know, I know we're going to talk a little bit about umpires and officiating and different things in terms of a, of a future show somewhere down the line. I, I would say some within the rules, I would like to see the strike zone a little bit bigger. Uh, I think it's a situation where the game of baseball has, has continued to be um, criticized for how slow and how much it can drag on sometimes. I think calling the strike zone a little bit more legitimate, stretching out particularly at the high school level could, could help a little bit. Um, I'm also bothered a little bit by uh, the analytics. I think at the higher levels, I think our ballparks have gotten smaller. I think the home run has become a big thing. So there's a lot more um, – less approach at the plate. It's more about get you a pitch you can drive out of the ballpark. So a lot of strikeouts, a lot of walks, a lot of home runs. And in a day of analytics and so forth, you know, I I see a lot of the hit and run, a lot of the bunning, a lot of the uh, the base stealing, some of those different things that are really, really exciting plays in baseball start to go away. So I think there's a little bit of the brand of baseball that goes, you know, when you talk analytics, Matt, what what surprises me sometimes is how we take certain numbers and stat sheets, or in this case, analytics, and make them say what we want them to say. You know, when I when I research numbers, and this is at the and this is even at the highest level of, of baseball, at the major league level, you may get, I don't know, two thirds of your catchers. They throw out less than thirty percent of the base stealers. Well, if you if you then start and look at like the top thirty to fifty base stealers in, in modern day baseball, they steal it successfully at eighty percent. So, so what are those analytics telling you? You see what I'm saying? It's one of those yeah. things where I, I just think that we've gotten caught in a generation. I don't know if it was through steroids. I don't know if it was through the whole McGuire Sosa thing back going back to those times or what, but we've gotten caught in a situation where we have um, maybe allowed the style of the game to change a little bit too and, and, and maybe not in, invited the athlete more and more. So those are some of the things that I would like to see um, – change well, a little Shane, bit in terms yeah, of just I, trying to help help the different type of athletes continue to, to choose baseball because without it Matt I guess the point that I was going to say was as a high school coach I have a hard time looking at that stud athlete and and providing them the same you know wow factor at a Tuesday night at five o'clock as they're going to get on a Friday night in the fall under the Friday night lights and, and you know 2,000 people in the stands. Well, yeah, it goes to, and you had mentioned, you know, basketball and baseball sort of being on this head-on collision, uh, and both because I think of a little bit of stubbornness in rule changes or not willing to make rule changes, right? We're going to talk about basketball at another day, so I'll leave that alone right now, but like in baseball, sometimes you, you, there's some rule changes that you could put in place to sort of help. I mean, let's face it. What sport in high school benefited more than volleyball from a rule change? Take no. volleyball for a minute. I mean, it, 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 is rally scoring possibly the best rule change in the history of high school sport or in, in, in a sport at all? I mean, how much more watchable is volleyball now and more exciting than it was when we were in high school? I mean, it, it's phenomenal. And that's one rule change that totally changed the game forever in a positive direction. And so, so I see what you're saying with some of that. And I think – Rule changes typically change style. You see what I'm saying? I mean, a lot of times style is dictated by the rules itself. The whole analytics thing is a fascinating deal. We could probably do uh, quite a show on analytics, but like analytics is always crazy to me because I, I'm, I'm a big numbers guy. Like in basketball, I, I, I study the data. I like numbers, but I think the problem is there's a lot of coaches that they want analytics to be the, the be all end all of, of every discussion. And to me, coaching is still an art more than a science. You know, if analytics could tell you everything you need to know about coaching, then you should just go grab the smartest math teacher in your school and tell him to coach every sport. Right. I mean, there's still an art to this. You can't just say, well, the book says this, let's do what it says. There's still a gut feeling. Sometimes there's still a time you got to make a call just because you have, like I said, you have a hunch that this kid's, going to do something good for you or whatever but but i think all those things the rules the the the, the analytic all those things um i think have led 
to baseball, for instance, being what it is right now. Some people may love it. Some people may not. But 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 I agree with you. I think there's some things the high school level, especially like you mentioned the strike zone. I agree with that. I think that with this new with with now with your pitch counts and stuff, you, you can't afford guys to be out there dying on the vine out on the mound for the speed of the game and and, and to keep batters you know uh, aggressive or whatnot. I think you do. I think those are small things you can do to improve to improve the product a little bit. But ultimately, and you you just said this. To end your statement a minute ago, you said you said I'm paraphrasing here. I can't offer this kid the same thing he can get in another sport, possibly with with the excitement or whatever. But that's where it comes back to the schools, as an athletic administration uh, and coaching staffs. We have to do whatever we can do to make it more attractive. Because here's the deal: kids see what is important. How a school treats a sport is basically sending a message to that kid, this is really important or this isn't. You know, when you don't take admissions, we're talking about it strictly from financial, Shane. But don't you think it sends a weird message that you don't charge admissions? For instance, I mean, like, hey, we think this sport's so important. We're charging people $5 a head. But this baseball thing you guys are doing in the spring, just go have some fun, man. It's just it's just something you're going to do for a couple months in the spring. I mean, it almost sends that message, doesn't it? When if we're not careful, we have to treat we have to treat these sports the same as we treat the other ones. Well, it does, and I think I think your most successful spring coaches have that that um, you know reputation in terms of he or she takes it you know, that's serious. They treat it like a varsity sport, as, as we might say. Right. And, and it is a situation where um, it, it is, it, 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 it's a seriousness of practice. It's, it's a serious, it's because you're, you're fighting some of the stereotype in terms of, you know, the weather starting to change. There's a lot of families, a lot of different people and waiting to do a lot of things or appointments here for this appointments here for that. And I tell you, they'll, they'll test the spring unlike they'll test the fall and the winter. Oh, no doubt about it. No doubt about it. Coaches. And so it is, there's a dynamic thing. So again, I'm not saying, I'm not saying high school baseball isn't great. I've been a part of it for, for two decades now. And I, and I love it. It's a, it's, it's an incredible thing to be a part of. I'm, I'm lucky to, to, to be in a, in a small school league that plays incredible baseball. The only thing on my message here on this show is we have to continue to look at our game moving forward to try to make it more inviting for more and more athletes to want to be a part of it, particularly at the at the school level. You know, you'll still have the Legion, you'll still have different things. But there's a lot of competition, as you said on past shows, in terms of these kids having opportunities to go play other club sports and, and, and work for different things and personal trainers for other sports and so forth. So again, you have to constantly be selling your brand. And I think those are the things I'm saying that if we can continue to sell our facilities, sell it to the media, bring more exposure to it. And then I, I really think at the higher levels, if we could start to promote our stars more and, and, and young people could start to, to look at the, the Mike Trout uh, the same way as they do a LeBron James. You see what I'm saying? And, right. and right now they just don't. And, and that, that, that's a situation of, of media and perception. The other word I had down in my notes here is, is urgency. And this is something that I know kind of drives us nuts sometimes for we're following our, our Cincinnati Reds or so forth. You know, it's 162 games and you'll hear them say, well, you can't win them all. And, you know, you, you'll go through these things. And, and I think sometimes what happens with baseball is because you play it so often over and over and over and over. And the sport lends itself to a little bit more parity that oftentimes what happens is that football is that once a week thrill and you throw in the dynamics of tailgating and you throw in the, the social event of it. You throw in the, at the higher levels, the, 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 the betting, uh, the fantasy football, the different things that, that go with it there. Uh, at the NBA, it's the same way, even though the higher levels, they still play a lot of games, you know, your March madness, your, your different things, even fantasy sports there, the playoffs, the, the draft, the, the free agency period, all of these different things are very, you know, enticing to the, to the media, therefore to the fans. And 
don't you think there's a little bit of a lack of urgency and, and it kind of maybe goes back to that tempo discussion that spring sports, be it baseball, softball, um, sometimes a track meet, this probably is true for that in terms of, of just the, the tempo and the overall urgency of we, we need it. I, I, I always say we, we live kind of in a microwave society, the day of the, of the crock pot, let the dinner sit for a while. Uh, we live in a more of a microwave society, got to have it right now. Don't you think that kind of, you know, kind of turns people off in terms of a game like baseball in, in today's culture? I think it can. Uh, I definitely think it can. I think that, uh, you know, I look back growing up, I mean, it, there wasn't 162 games on TV. You know, it, it was exciting when your favorite team was on TV. Now it's just sort of there all the time, which for a guy like me and you, we love, right? We want to sit down and watch baseball all the time. But uh, for some people, you know, like a lot of my friends make fun of me because, you know, I'll, I'll watch my favorite baseball team, which I've mentioned on here before is the Reds, play. They'll blow a game in May and I'll throw a fit and my friends will say, oh, yeah, that's that's a big loss tonight, man. They've only got like 135 games left. <laughs> and and so they, so they like to make fun of me for that. But, like, I think that's what happens with baseball sometimes. I mean, the same argument can be made in the NBA, right? 82 games, oh, man, how, how much does the regular season really matter? But – I think if you're not careful, you do develop a lack of of, of or it it almost just lulls you into this sort of like all oh, shucks, easy come, easy go type of thing. And um, high school baseball, though, is, is it can be so different than that. With a shorter season, everything should be more exciting. Mm-hmm. Every game does matter more. I think Shane, what I what I've as as you've been talking here, I've just sort of been taking some notes and and. Going back to what we've talked about in some of our previous shows was sort of like the hierarchy. When we did the chain of leadership off of the last dance, we talked about everybody's responsibility. Mm -hmm. I almost look at this with with spring sports like that a little bit. Like I think it starts with whichever end of that chain you want to start on, but let's start with players and coaches. Players and coaches, it's almost that urgency you're talking about of treating it serious of, of A, treat it the same as the other sports. Don't come to me and ask if you can miss a game on Saturday to go to Kings Island when you wouldn't ask your football coach that, I guarantee you. Or you wouldn't ask your basketball coach that, right? Some kids wouldn't dream in a million years of doing that. But, oh, man, it's just one baseball game. I'm going to Kings Island with my girlfriend, right? Don't do that. Treat it the same. And coaches treat it the same, right? Um, as coaches, do you have to be more flexible, in the spring, I think you do. Don't 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 you agree with that, Shane? I mean, you have to be a little more flexible, but you can't go too far with it. Yeah, I I, I think that's involved in coaching, just in general today. But yes, yes, in the spring, sometimes you do have to get a little dynamic in your scheduling, and um, you know, obviously, your schedule's unpredictable with weather and inside outside practices, different things. So, so yeah, I think. I think you have to work with 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 kids and families there and, and communicate for sure. But but there is there is that fine line of you know you have to make your sport matter, as I'd like to say. I mean, it has to be. Hey, this is a varsity sport, and the expectations are as such. So again, going back to our solutions, so players and coaches, that's really what where what they have to do. They have to treat the game seriously. They have to make it you know, like every other sport and, and from an administration level, athletic director and on up, uh, what, what, what solutions can the schools offer? Well, I think we've touched, touched on them on here, the financial part, right? Can you, we make the sport more financially viable, stable? Can we make a little bit, I mean, make probably not going to profit, but can we, can we offset, I guess Off is the best the blow, way to say yeah. it, You're right? Offset some of those costs and send a message you know, by charging for games, by attending games, by just just promoting games, by send a message that, hey, these sports, track, baseball, softball, uh, whatever is going on in the spring, they're just as important as the other sports. You know, sending that message to our student athletes so that they see that. And then lastly, and I think this was one of the key things you hit on, was at the state level, the start dates and the end dates. I, I, I see, I just don't see any reason why we have to start and end, like why why we have to start when it, the weather is so questionable and end basically by the end of may um I, I to me we could give ourselves a couple more weeks um 
in that direction to where we start a little later, end a little later. And I think that would help. I just think that would help athletes like the sport a little bit more, be involved in the sport. Think about this. If you're a basketball player, Shane, we didn't even talk about this. If let's say your team makes a district tournament, man, you're, you're worn out, right? It's like, gosh, are you, are you that excited to say, Hey, baseball coach, Hey, track coach, I'll be there Monday, man. You know what I mean? I, 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 no, I, I mean, it every year and, and kids need time off. They want time off, whatever. What if we started those sports a little later? I mean, we started track and baseball practice this year, February 24th or something. I mean, hey, it's winter, you know, it's, it's, it's in the winter time. So why not push those back a little bit? I think that's the biggest thing that the, that our state association could do for spring sports. And there's no reason it's just not interfering with enough. If, if baseball, if the state tournament ends up being the 15th of June instead of the first, that's not interfering with anything. That's really not interfering with basketball that much. You can work around that. You're only talking about the teams making it to the highest level. It's not interfering with football yet. You know, that's the biggest thing I think the state could do. But, I mean, I, I guess we always talk about solutions, so I guess that's why I wanted to mention those things sort of on that hierarchy of, of different – solutions that people could do and and i think in in closing here th this is my thought we were kind of on the same page there matt as i as i close i could sit here and talk another 45 50 minutes on just high school baseball because how passionate i am there's some things i don't want to i don't want to get going down other avenues because again if you become a fan of expanding the zone you're going to hear so many different show ideas that we have and when the time is right, we're going to present those. But like we've talked about role of the media. We've talked about little league. We've talked about rule changes, all of these different things. I, I have ideas that I'll probably get to more in our basketball in terms of our division breakdown here in Ohio. I'd love to hear from other states on how do you do it in terms of, of setting up a little bit more competitive balance and, and, and allowing a, a better opportunity for more teams, more kids to be successful, for more schools to, to, to get an opportunity uh, to, to go on some of those special rides. So all of these different things, um, I think at the highest level, baseball is completely missing the boat. I don't think they would have to go away from some of their historical things if they would make more games matter. You know, I've seen some some levels of baseball, Matt, use a first half, second half winner in terms of could you imagine how many more fan bases would be excited if coming out of the all-star break, the, the standings changed and you had a first half and a second half winner, how much more your ESPNs and your Foxes would love if, if some of those games at the end of the first round and leading into the all-star game and then coming out of the all-star game, you'd have more teams that mattered, more fan bases that cared. So, so again, I don't, I don't want to sit here and rattle on and on and on tonight, but I, I have so many different solutions. And some things is we, like we tell our kids, control the things you can control, right? There's right. certain things we kind of, we put on that wish list. And if we ever had an opportunity to work with the OHSA or the ODE or whatever those things might be, it'd be fine. But when it comes to strike zone, it comes to style of play, when it comes to uh, pushing games to certain sites or at certain times to, to kind of promote the game a little bit more and to, and to get media more involved, to get some radio involved, a little bit more newspaper coverage, more website coverages. I think those are all things that we owe to our sport, owe to our athletes, because again, if you love baseball, you love baseball. But I know one thing I'd like to do is, is moving into the next 10 years, I would like to draw some of the elite athletes into my sport, right? I would like, yeah. to, I would like to see more and more people feel like that, oh, I'm a stud athlete. Why can't be a baseball player? You know what I mean? I don't have to go be a football player or a basketball player or, or I have to go run track or what. I, oh, I'm athletic. I can, I, can, I can utilize these five tools, as we like to say, in baseball. To, to do that so that that's where i'm coming from um but if but if but if, if fans are listening tonight and they have ideas of these little leagues and they have ideas of of uh, media coverage and if they have ideas of rule changes i think these are all things that are going to lead to some really really cool show ideas here on expanding the zone and i i know matt that we've we've kind of prided ourselves on not wanting to just say here's the next three shows, you know what I'm saying? We wanted to kind right. of what is relevant. And as these little league things started to come down from the top and we're hearing the colleges and the different things and what's happened to high school sports, it just, it just made sense to do this. Now, I guess in closing thoughts, 
feel free to add anything on that. But I would love to hear from you maybe in closing on what what are you most ex, what are you most excited about in terms of future shows coming up that might be on three or four of those things we teased here this evening? Yeah, I mean, I think we're going to have various topics to touch on. Um, you know, I, I definitely look at I, I enjoy these the shows where we talk about like an individual sport, um, like kind of like we have tonight. I mean, I know we've touched on softball track a little bit, but it's been kind of a baseball show, I think, mainly. But spring sports in general, and we're going to we'll do the same for football and basketball at some point. Um, talking about just where those games are at, right? The state of the game, like we call it, of a high school basketball or high school football, and where do we go from here? So I'm looking forward to some of those, but I think there's some other shows that'll crop up. One of the things we talked about when we started this show was as things happen in the world of sports, we want to take those things and sort of use them at the height, like take them down to the high school level. Well, there's not a whole lot happening in the world of sports right now. So um, hopefully that'll change, right? I mean, I'd like to think over the next couple months, some some things will start to open up and we'll see some of that. So there may be shows you and I haven't even thought about yet that just may kind of crop up. The other thing is, like you said, is people that listen, send us some stuff. You know, here's what I, we did a show based on, uh, one guy's email that said, Hey, would you touch on this? Would you do a show about transfers? Remember? And then we tied that into, to, to a couple different topics along with that. So, um, again, just looking forward to, to doing this every week and, uh, hopefully finding topics that people find interesting and, and hopefully taking an angle, a unique angle on those topics. Well, absolutely. And again, that's SVC sports zone, Shane on YouTube. So if you're out there listening on your podcast, um, app, uh, uh, and you want to check us out on YouTube, you can go SVC Sports Zone, Shane, and, and you can see um, our, our six episodes at this point so far. Again, if you're on YouTube and you want to get us on podcast, just go to wherever you get your podcast app, Apple, Spotify, all the way across the board. So, again, uh, that kind of wraps up our sixth show. Uh, I think we have a ton of topics out there, excited to get to, excited to kind of see what uh, what will happen, uh, but I think it's going to make for a really, really fun year on expanding the zone. So on that note, we'll get on out of here, Matt. It's been a lot of fun. Uh, thank you for listening. Thank you for watching, and uh, we hope to see you on expanding the zone here soon. Thank you.